okay uh hello good good afternoon good morning and good evening everyone so this is the friday afternoon session and we have three great uh talks lined up first talk is by dr devasa but first of all we are here to check if you are able to hear us and because we are having some audio issues at uh, dr devasa's side so Dr. Devesa, I request you to please say something so that the audience can confirm if they can hear you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? OK, OK. So the audience says that uh, they can hear both of us. Oh. So we are going to go. <laughs> and, but I cannot hear you, so it's fine. I mean, I'll uh, track over when you less. OK. Okay, so let's get started, uh, shall we? Yes, yes. so uh, first yes. of all, I'll introduce, uh, yeah, okay, I'll introduce you. And uh, so a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening all. And we are here for the Friday afternoon session in the room Cordoba of the FOSS 4G 2021. We have three great uh, talks lined up today and by three great speakers as well. Our first speaker is Dr. Maria Roberta Devesa, and she will be talking about SATPROC, an open source library to train, deploy segmentation, uh, to train and deploy deep segmentation neural networks for geospatial imagery. So I'll quickly introduce Dr. Devesa first. Uh, she's a uh, senior data scientist in Dimaxion Labs, and she also holds a PhD in physics in high energy experimental physics from University of Buenos Aires. So thank you so much for coming to this session and uh, we, uh, this stage is yours for the talk. Okay. So I will request you to please share your slides. Okay. So can you hear me? And also, can you see the slides? Yes, we can hear you, and the slides are also perfect. Thanks. Okay, great. So, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. So, I'm going to talk about uh, Sapro Tool, which is an open source library to train and deploy deep segmentation neural nets for geospatial image gallery. So, first, uh, for the agenda of today, I will introduce first uh, Dimax Labs. Then I want to motivate um, for using um, satellite images and machine learning models. I will show you some of uh, our open source libraries. I will give a brief introduction to machine learning segmentation models. Then I will go to present about the unit segmentation tool and the SAPRO tool as well. And at the end, I will, link, I will let you some links that you may find useful. So let's start. First, a few words about, about us. We are a company specialized in instructing insight from the geospatial information for large territorial extensions. It was born in um, 2018 in Buenos Aires, Argentina. It was supported by UNICEF Innovation Fund, uh, Gobierno de la Ciudad de Buenos Aires program in Kuwait. And we have an open source philosophy to create geospatial analytics tools uh, for different studies. So there on bottom, I leave some links to the main repositories. Um, 
It started when we saw this case. This is um, Fiorito in Buenos Aires in 2010. This year was the last population sense that we had. Then you can see how uh, this green area was slowly taken by informal settlements across the following years until be totally full. So since we had the pandemic, we didn't uh, have another uh, population sense. So the data is really out of date. So thinking of that, our goal was uh, to deploy technology to update the data where we learn territory extensions in an economic and fast way and be able to update it frequently. And with all these things, we want to extract insights for decision taking. So the pipeline normalizes as follows, where first we get the um, satellite images or can be also images from drones or another sources. Then we also get the annotation with the ground true of the object that we want to detect. We store that information and we run our um, models over them in order to get the different kind of output like uh, maps or reports or dashboard or also alerts and notifications. So on the last time we were working um, over three lines. The first one is regarding to the community and the urbanization. In this case, we use the satellite images to detect informal settlements and floor areas. And with this information, the governments can take urban planning policies. And then we also work with the agriculture. In this case, we use satellite images to do a classification of the different crops. And we cross that information with the um, uh, natural risk areas. And with this, the farmers and the supply companies can plan their production. We also work uh, on this last time with the environment conservation. In this case, uh, we, for instance, we did a study about um, following the deforestation across the different weeks and the appearance of a growth of the informal settlements. With this, we made several reports for organizations like development banks and governments. So as you can see, in the current days, um, there are more and more studies that um, are done address, um, that are addressed using satellite images. And in many of these cases, these images are processed using uh, uh, machine learning tools. And this allows to process big extension of areas fast and at low cost. So I, I will be talking about UNITSEC, which tool, which is a segmentation machine model developed as a Python library to train and predict different um, objects. And since each machine learning model requires a specific data structure to be processed, I will also present a separate tool, which was uh, developed as well as a Python library that can help, help us to create the data set uh, with um, a structured need for the machine learning segmentation models. So, some of our open source libraries are, well, as I told you right before, a separate tool and the unit set. But there are, we also have some repositories open to everyone, like um, the, the last one that I mentioned here, which is about um, detecting uh, waste dumps across Buenos Aires in this case, but can be different um, countries. And this repository used the tools that I'm going to talk about. Um, so as an example, you can check that also and, and see how the, these tools are implemented. So let's start with the first one, the unit seg. So in computer vision, there are different machine learning models to analyze the images. We can, for instance, do a classification or we can do a detection where we not only classify the object, we also find them into the image, or we can also do a segmentation where we also get the outer line of the different objects. But each of these uh, models requires a specific data uh, format to be processed. And we are going to focus on this last one. <coughs> okay, so one of the most common segmentation models is the unit architecture, which is 
uh, which was developed for cement and classify different objects <coughs> in biomedical images. The names come from the shape of the architecture, which is like a new. It is divided in two main parts. The first one is uh, the contracting part, where the main features of the image are extracted as it passes through the different layers. And then the second part is the expansive part, um, where the original size is recovered, combining these main characteristics with the high resolution information from the previous layers. So for this kind of model, the output will be like the image on top right, where we classify the different objects and get in the outer line of each of them. So regarding to the inputs and the output that the model needs, during the training, we need to give to the model a data set of images. And for each image, we need to give it um, a mask. We will be a binary image with one where the object is and zero otherwise. If we are trying to classify between different classes, then the mask will be an n-dimensional image composed from n binary uh, mask, where n is will be equal to the number of categories that we want to classify. Then during the prediction process, we only have to give uh, a new image and the model will give us an image where each pixel represents the probability of finding that object. So when we are talking about this kind of model, we also need to say some words about how much do we have to train? Because if we train too much, then the model will fit perfect the data used for the training data set. When we give it a new data value, the error can be big. However, on the other side, if we don't train enough, um, then the, the, the model will never fit the data. And that means that it's not learning how to recognize the pattern of the image. So in order to avoid this kind of problem, what we do is we analyze the error across the training process. And we divide the data into training data set and a validation data set. And we also apply an early stop command. We'll be stopping the training process when it finds that the error over the validation data set is starting to increase. Also, we need to know about the metrics because it gives us a measure of the performance of the model. Uh, in order to get the metric, we in reality split the full data set into a training part for uh, use it only to train the model, then a validation part use it to define the optimal parameters of the model. And finally, we use this test data set to compute the final metrics once that we already defined the model that we are going to use. In computer vision, one of the most um, common metrics used is the intersection over union, which is the overlap between the prediction and the target over the common area of both. It goes to one as the performance improves. So to implement this in a, um, in a notebook, for instance, first we, can, we have to well, install this tool um, then you import the functions that we are going to use, like the training and uh, the evaluation. And then um, define the configuration file for the training. So what we are going to do here is uh, set the size of the image for the model, define the number of channels. I don't know if you see, can see the mouse, but we can uh, define the number of channels. If we are working with RGB, then it's going to be three, but in satellite, uh, images, we can use like many bands, so this value can change. Also the number of classes that we want to classify. Um, and then there are some features that are more regarding to the model itself. Uh, if we apply image augmentation, what it's going to do is to create new data using a small variation from the image that we are giving to the model in order to have a more robust uh, model to, to make the prediction later. Um, then the number of epoch, this is the number of time that the full data set are going to pass, a, are going to use for the training process. And then uh, we also can define in the, the fraction in which we, we want to split the, 
the data set for the validation and as well for the test uh, to compute the final metrics. Um, we can define the model architecture. Uh, we can use uh, the unit, as I just mentioned a few slides ago. But uh, we can also use another model called unit++, which is very similar architecture, but with more uh, layers. Then we have to define the path to the to the image and the mask used to train the model, and also a path to where we want to uh, save the model once it is done. Evaluation equal true means that um, it's going to perform the final metrics using the test um, data set. And class weight um, is it's very useful when you have like different uh, object that you want to detect, but they are like they are not balanced. So setting here, like um, for instance, 0 0.8 for the first class and 0 0.2 for the second class, then it's going to focus more on one class than the than the another one. Um, then we have this uh, function here that allow us to print some examples of the training data set. So this will show us the, the image and the mask next to it. Um, this is very useful because we have to be sure that the object that we want to classify can be seen with that size of the image. Um, and then finally, we have the training uh, where we give the config file that we defined previously and we run the train. And with this, the model will all, do all the training. First, they are going to print the, the shape of the architecture, then the number of samples that they are using for training, validation, and testing. And then we run the, the, the training. Then for the prediction part, in a very similar way, first we import the functions used to predict, like the predict and evaluate as well. In this case, the prediction config file will be uh, it's more, it's more short. We have to only give the path to the uh, image or we want to make the prediction. Then uh, give a new path for the results. Um, give the path to the model that we trained in the previous step. Again, the kind of architecture that we're going to work with, the size of the image, the number of channels, and the number of classes, and as well the class weight. Then we run the prediction. And finally, with this command, we can plot some of the results. Then, uh, now talking about the processing, for machine learning segmentation model, that means the separate tool. This tool creates um, the data set of images and masks used uh, to train the model. And for this, it uses a image and a vector file with the polygons that delimit the objects of interest. In this case, we can see an image of solar panels. And in green, we can see all the polygons that um, mark this class over the image. So how it works, it set a window that sweeps through the image. And if there is a polygon inside, it creates a binary mask with one where polygon is and zero, zero otherwise. Then it moves to the next step and repeat the process. For more than one class, the process is performing for each class and all the masks created into the same window are concatenated together, producing an binary mask of n channels. So in general, the outputs are like this, uh, as I so you, show you on the small images on the right. So a full data set of these tiny images and the respective mask. Then there are many features that we can set on separate tool. For instance, we can define the window size as I told you, it's important that we have to be able to see the object that we want to classify into the image. It cannot be too big or too small. Also, if we don't have like, enough data to train, we can use a Windows a step size uh, smaller than the window size. In this case, 
we're going to reuse the image many times uh, across the creation of the data set. So it was more than one for the same part of the image. Um, then there are some features that we can apply later for the post process, uh, doing the pro processing of the results. In this case, uh, it can filter the results concerning the threshold value over the, uh, the probability. Uh, applying a, a function called filter by max probability, this will filter all the results that none of the pixels uh, have a value higher than a threshold value that we define. And we can also can polygonize the results. So in this case, we are going to convert the raster output file into a vector file. And we can also apply a filter. In this case, will be a filter to each pixel of the image. So in this case, for instance, we have like the image on the left, in the middle is the prediction, and on the right is the prediction after pass uh, by the threshold of the probability. So um, to run this, this tool, first of all, we have to install it, then we need to define the path to the image, to the original big image uh, to work with, then a path to the um, for the output uh, folder where the data set we recreated the data set of images and masks are going to be created uh, there. Um, then the path to the vector file uh, with the ground true, and then as well uh, if we want to make run this process over a small area or the final area of, and not over the full image. We can also define a region of interest to run this command. Then we can define the size and the step size. And there are some other features that we can also define. We can explore this tool using the help command. And here we can see that, for instance, we can uh, do a rescale of the values of the image. Uh, there are different settings for the rescale. For instance, uh, we can use the percentile of the values of the image to make the rescale. We can uh, set like a minimum and a maximum value for all the bands of the image or a combination of both. There are different features you can explore all of them. Um, okay, then here I leave you some of the links. The first two are from this tool, the repository of this tool. Uh, you can access that are like open to everyone. Then the third one is the collab example that use separate tool and unit sec tool um, over through an example. I mean, in this case also leave you on that um, example, some links to download some data to run this command. It's not enough to get a good performance of the model, but it is good enough to be able to try all the commands and all the functions uh, that it has. Um, then I also leave you um, a link to um, a, like a note that we made mapping illegal waste stamp uh, using this tools tool. And there are many things like the metric that we are using that are well defined there can be very useful, and also the repository to this um, study case. So this is all. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, oh, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Roberta, for the great and very insightful presentation. I was looking through the interaction on the uh, during the live presentation, and uh, it was very like it was appreciated very well. So uh, we have a couple of questions. So first question is, what are the dependencies of UnitSec and SatProc in general? Uh, well, it used Rasterio, for instance, and for the um, 
unit sec, it also needs a keras and TensorFlow. Okay. Uh, any specific version of keras or TensorFlow, or is it uh, constantly updated? Yeah, it's, it's a, um, um, a version. I don't remember right now which one. It's on the repository, but also we need to update it. So I hope soon it's going to be the last version. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other question is, uh, where do you get the polygons from? Are they manually digitized? I think this is uh, with regards to the creating the data set when we are working with SATPROC. Okay, the the polygon, I mean, the, the vector file with the polygon is something that you need to give to the, to the command. Um, I usually use uh, QGIS uh, to create it. But that depends, of course, of the study that you want to run. So it's not that you can get it some some place. It's something that most of the time you create it for your study mm -hmm. uh, in particular. Okay, um, I have a very uh, naive question. I might uh, you might have uh, mentioned this in your presentation as well, but I might have missed it. So, is there any use case uh, going beyond segmentation, like instance segmentation or for classification purposes in the plans going ahead? Uh, well, there are all studies about detection and classification, but uh, we do it, we use it like for several things. We can use it for uh, crop classification as well, for and uh, detection of uh, informal settlements, for um, well, the direction of uh, waste dumps across uh, different countries um, is like for anything that you want to get uh, the object with the outer line of the object that may work. Also, with the tech roads and houses and parking lots, there, there are a lot of things that you can do with it. Okay, that's very interesting, and I think uh, with this kind of uh, algorithm, it will be very easy with this kind of library. It will be very easy for people who are not very well versed with deep learning uh, theory to get started with the applications. Yeah, it's easy so, to set and you can use it very quickly. Yes, I'll definitely go uh, go out and check this out. And so I cannot see any further questions from here. So I thank you very much for your talk. It was very insightful and. Uh, Thank you very much. Have a great pause for your head. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, sorry. Actually, there is a question coming up just now. Can you show the slides with links again? Okay. Ah, yeah, sure. I can also show you the uh, here, like the the link to the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, I posted the GitHub link on the chat. Maybe you can check it first. I will. This is the link to the talk. So, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, uh, thank you. I have just posted it on Venulus so that the audience can also see it. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, thank you so much again for the talk and uh, have a good day or good evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, this was a very interesting talk. Now coming back to the next talk is uh, another exploration of uh, new programming language.